Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come, come back, mother? What's the secret? Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker When we started for our drive, the sun was shining brightly in Munich, and the air was full of the joyousness of early summer. Just as we were about to depart, Herr Delbruck, the maid at the hotel of the Quatre Saisons where I was staying, came down bareheaded to the carriage, and after wishing me a pleasant drive, said to the coachman, still holding his hand on the handle of the carriage door, Remember you are back by nightfall. The sky looks bright, but there is a shiver in the north wind that says that there may be a sudden storm. But I am sure you will not be late. He, he smiled and added, For you know what night it is. Johann answered with an emphatic, Ja, mein Herr, and touching his hat drove off quickly. When we had cleared town, I said, after signalling to him to stop, Tell me, Johann, what is tonight? He crossed himself as he answered laconically, Walpurgisnacht. Then he took out his watch, a great old-fashioned German silver thing as big as a turnip, and looked at it, with his eyebrows gathered together and a little impatient shrug of his shoulders. I realised that this was his way of respectfully protesting against the unnecessary delay, and sank back in the carriage, merely motioning him to proceed. He started off rapidly as if to make up for lost time. Every now and then the horses seemed to throw up their heads and sniff the air suspiciously. On such occasions I often looked around in alarm. The road was pretty bleak, for we were traversing a sort of high, windswept plateau. As we drove, I saw a road that looked but little used, and which seemed to dip through a little winding valley. It looked so inviting that even at the risk of offending him I called Johann to stop, and when he had pulled up I told him I would like to drive down that road. He made all sorts of excuses and frequently crossed himself as he spoke. This somewhat piqued my curiosity, so I asked him various questions. He answered fencingly and repeatedly looked at his watch in protest. Finally, I said, Well, Johann, I want to go down this road. I shall not ask you to come unless you like, but tell me why you do not like to go. That's all I ask. For answer, he seemed to throw himself off the box so quickly did he reach the ground. Then he stretched out his hands appealingly to me and implored me not to go. There was just enough of English mixed with the German for me to understand the drift of his talk. He seemed always just about to tell me something, the very idea of which evidently frightened him. But each time he pulled himself up, saying as he crossed himself, Walpurgisnacht. I tried to argue with him, but it was difficult to argue with a man when I did not know his language. The advantage certainly rested with him, for although he began to speak in English of a very crude and broken kind, he always got excited and broke into his native tongue, and every time he did so, he looked at his watch. Then the horses became restless and sniffed the air. At this he grew very pale, and looking around in a frightened way, he suddenly jumped forward took them by the bridles and led them on some twenty feet. I followed and asked why he'd done this. For answer, he crossed himself, pointed to the spot we had left, and drew his carriage in the direction of the other road, indicating a cross, and said, first in German, then in English, buried him, him, what killed themselves. I remembered the old custom of burying suicides at crossroads. Ah, I see a suicide. How interesting but for the life of me I couldn't make out why the horses were frightened. Whilst we were talking, we heard a sort of sound between a yelp and a bark. It was far away, but the horses got very restless, and it took Johann all his time to quiet them. He was pale and said, It sounds like a wolf, but yet there are no wolves here now. No, I said, questioning him. Isn't it long since wolves were so near the city? Long, long, he answered. In the spring and summer... But with the snow, the wolves have been here not so long. Whilst he was petting the horses and trying to quiet them, dark clouds drifted rapidly across the sky. The sunshine passed away, and a breath of cold wind seemed to drift past us. It was only a breath, however, and more in the nature of a warning than a fact, for the sun came out brightly again. Johann looked under his lifted hand at the horizon and said, The storm of snow, it comes before a long time. 
Then he looked at his watch again, and straight away holding his reins firmly, for the horses were still pawing the ground restlessly and shaking their heads. He climbed to his box, as though the time had come for proceeding on our journey. I felt a little obstinate, and did not at once get into the carriage. "'Tell me,' I said, "'about this place where the road leads,' and I pointed down. Again he crossed himself and mumbled a prayer before he answered. "'It is unholy.' "'What is unholy?' I inquired. "'The village. Then there is a village. No, no, no one lives there hundreds of years. My curiosity was piqued. But you said there was a village. There was. Where is it now?' Whereupon he burst out into a long story in German and English so mixed up that I couldn't quite understand exactly what he said. But roughly I gathered that long ago, hundreds of years, men had died there, and had been buried in their graves, and sounds were heard under the clay. And when the graves were opened, men and women were found rosy with life, and their mouths red with blood. And so in haste to save their lives, aye, and their souls, and here he crossed himself, those who were left fled away to other places where the living lived, and the dead were dead, and not, uh, not something. He was evidently afraid to speak the last words. As he proceeded with his narration, he grew more and more excited. It seemed as if his imagination had got hold of him, and he ended in a perfect paroxysm of fear, white-faced, perspiring, trembling, and looking round him, as if expecting that some dreadful presence would manifest itself there in the bright sunshine on the open plain. Finally, in an agony of desperation, he cried, Walpurgisnacht, and pointed to the carriage for me to get in. All my English blood rose at this, and standing back I said, You're afraid, Johann, you're afraid. Go home. I shall return alone. The walk will do me good. The carriage door was open. I took from the seat my oak walking stick, which I always carry on my holiday excursions, and closed the door, pointing back to Munich, and said, Go home, Johann. Walpurgisnacht doesn't concern Englishmen. The horses were now more restive than ever, and Johann was trying to hold them in while excitedly imploring me not to do anything so foolish. I pitied the poor fellow. He was deeply in earnest, but all the same I couldn't help laughing. His English was quite gone now. In his anxiety he had forgotten that his only means of making me understand was to talk my language, so he jabbered away in his native German. It began to be a little tedious. After giving the direction home, I turned to go down the crossroad into the valley. With a despairing gesture, Johann turned his horses towards Munich. I leaned on my stick and looked after him. He went slowly along the road for a while. Then there came over the crest of the hill a man, tall and thin. I could see so much in the distance. When he drew near the horses, they began to jump and kick about, then to scream with terror. Johann couldn't hold them in. They bolted down the road, running away madly. I watched them out of sight, then looked for the stranger, but I found that he too was gone. With a light heart I turned down the side road through the deepening valley to which Johann objected. There was not the slightest reason that I could see for his objection, and I dare say I tramped for a couple of hours without thinking of time or distance, and certainly without seeing a person or a house. So far as the place was concerned, there was desolation itself, but I didn't notice this particularly till, on turning a bend in the road, I came upon a scattered fringe of wood. Then I recognised that I had been impressed unconsciously by the desolation of the region through which I had passed. I sat down to rest myself and began to look around. It struck me that it was considerably colder than it had been at the commencement of my walk. A sort of sighing sound seemed to be around me, with, now and then, high overhead, a sort of muffled roar. Looking upwards, I noticed that great thick clouds were drifting rapidly across the sky from north to south at a great height. There were signs of coming storm in some lofty stratum of the air. I was a little chilly, and thinking that it was a sitting still after the exercise of walking, I resumed my journey. The ground I passed over was now much more picturesque. There were no striking objects that the eye might single out, but in all there was a charm of beauty. I took little heed of time, and it was only when the deepening twilight forced itself upon me that I began to think of how I should find my way home. The brightness of the day had gone, the air was cold, and the drifting of clouds high overhead was more marked. 
they were accompanied by a sort of faraway rushing sound, through which seemed to come at intervals that mysterious cry which the driver had said came from a wolf. For a while I hesitated. I had said that I would see the deserted village, so on I went, and presently came on a wide stretch of open country, shut in by hills all around. Their sides were covered with trees which spread down to the plain, dotting in clumps, the gentlest slopes and hollows which showed here and there. I followed with my eye the winding of the road and saw that it curved close to one of the densest of those clumps and was lost behind it. As I looked, there came a cold shiver in the air and the snow began to fall. I thought of the miles and miles of bleak country I had passed and then hurried on to seek the shelter of the wood in front. Darker and darker grew the sky and faster and heavier fell the snow till the earth before and around me was a glistening white carpet the further edge of which was lost in misty vagueness. The road here was but crude, and when on the level its boundaries were not so marked as when it passed through the cuttings, and in a little while I found that I must have strayed from it, for I had missed underfoot the hard surface, and my feet sank deeper in the grass and moss. Then the wind grew stronger and blew with ever-increasing force, till I was fain to run before it, the air became icy cold, and in spite of my exercise I began to suffer. The snow was now falling so thickly and whirling around me in such rapid eddies that I could hardly keep my eyes open. Every now and then the heavens were torn asunder by vivid lightning, and in the flashes I could see ahead of me a great mass of trees, chiefly yew and cypress, all heavily coated with snow. I was soon amongst the shelter of the trees, and there, in comparative silence, I could hear the rush of the wind high overhead. Presently the blackness of the storm had become merged in the darkness of the night. By and by the storm seemed to be passing away. It now only came in fierce puffs or blasts. At such moments the weird sound of the wolf appeared to be echoed by many similar sounds around me. Now and again, through the black mass of drifting cloud, came a straggling ray of moonlight which lit up the expanse and showed me that I was at the edge of a dense mass of cypress and yew trees. As the snow had ceased to fall, I walked out from the shelter and began to investigate more closely. It appeared to me that amongst so many old foundations that I had passed, there might still be standing a house in which, though in ruins, I could find some sort of shelter for a while. As I skirted the edge of the copse, I found that a low wall encircled it, and following this, I presently found an opening. Here the cypresses formed an alley leading up to a square mass of some kind of building. Just as I caught sight of this, however, the drifting clouds obscured the moon, and uh, I passed up the path in darkness. The wind must have grown colder, for I felt myself shiver as I walked. But there was hope of shelter, and I groped my way blindly on. I stopped, for there was a sudden stillness. The storm had passed, and... Perhaps in sympathy with nature's silence, my heart seemed to cease to beat. But this was only momentarily, for suddenly the moonlight broke through the clouds, showing me that I was in a graveyard, and that the square object before me was a great massive tomb of marble, as white as the snow that lay on and all around it. With the moonlight there came a fierce sigh of the storm, which appeared to resume its course with a long, low howl as of many dogs or wolves. I was awed and shocked and felt the cold perceptibly grow upon me till it seemed to grip me by the heart. Then, while the flood of moonlight still fell on the marble tomb, the storm gave further evidence of renewing as though it was returning on its track. Impelled by some sort of fascination, I approached the sepulchre to see what it was and why such a thing stood alone in such a place. I walked around it and read over the Doric door in German, Countess Dollingen of Graz in Styria, sought and found death, 1801. On the top of the tomb, seemingly driven through the solid marble, for the structure was composed of a few vast blocks of stone, was a great iron spike or stake. On going to the back, I saw graven in great Russian letters, The dead travel fast. There was something so weird and uncanny about the whole thing that it gave me a turn and made me feel quite faint. I began to wish for the first time that I had taken Johann's advice 
Here a thought struck me which came under almost mysterious circumstances and with a terrible shock. This was Walpurgisnacht. Walpurgis night, when, according to the belief of millions of people, the devil was abroad, when the graves were opened and the dead came forth and walked, when all evil things of earth and air and water held revel. This very place the driver had specially shunned. This was a depopulated village of centuries ago. This was where the suicide lay, and this was the place where I was alone, unmanned, shivering with cold in a shroud of snow with a wild storm gathering again upon me. It took all my philosophy, all the religion I had been taught, all my courage not to collapse in a paroxysm of fright. And now a perfect tornado burst upon me. The ground shook as though thousands of horses thundered across it. And this time the store bore on its icy wings not snow, but great hailstones, which drove with such violence that they might have come from the thongs of Balearic slingers. Hailstones had beat down leaf and branch and made the shelter of the cypresses of no more avail than though their stems were standing corn. At the first I had rushed to the nearest tree, but I was soon fain to leave it and seek the only spot that seemed to afford refuge, the deep Doric doorway of the marble tomb. There, crouching against the massive bronze door, I gained a certain amount of protection from the beating of the hailstones, for now they only drove against me as they ricocheted from the ground and the side of the marble. As I leaned against the door, it moved slightly and opened inwards. The shelter of even the tomb was welcome in that pitiless tempest, and I was about to enter it when there came a flash of forked lightning that lit up the whole expanse of the heavens. In the instant, as I am a living man, I saw, as my eyes were turned into the darkness of the tomb, a beautiful woman with rounded cheeks and red lips seemingly sleeping on a bier. As the thunder broke overhead, I was grasped as by the hand of a giant and hurled out into the storm. The whole thing was so sudden that before I could realise the shock, moral as well as physical, I found the hailstones beating me down. At the same time I had a strange, dominating feeling that I was not alone. I looked towards the tomb. Just then came another blinding flash which seemed to strike the iron stake that surmounted the tomb and to pour through to the earth, blasting and crumbling the marble as in a burst of flame. The dead woman rose for a moment of agony while she was lapped in the flame, and her bitter scream of pain was drowned in the thunder crash. The last thing I heard was this mingling of dreadful sound, as again I was seized by the giant grasp and dragged away, while the hailstones beat on me, and the air around seemed reverberant with the howling of wolves. The last sight that I remembered was a vague white moving mass, as if all the graves around me had sent out the phantoms of their sheeted dead, and that they were closing in on me to the white cloudiness of the driving hail. Gradually there came a sort of vague beginning of consciousness, then a sense of weariness that was dreadful. For a time I remembered nothing, but slowly my senses returned. My feet seemed positively racked with pain, yet I couldn't move them. They seemed to be numbed. There was an icy feeling at the back of my neck and all down my spine and my ears, like my feet were dead, yet in torment. But there was in my breast a sense of warmth which was, by comparison, delicious. It was a nightmare, a physical nightmare, if one may use such an expression, for some heavy weight on my chest made it difficult for me to breathe. This period of semi-lethargy seemed to remain a long time, and as it faded away I must have slept or swooned. Then came a sort of loathing, like the first stage of a seasickness, and a wild desire to be free from something, I knew not what. A vast stillness enveloped me as though all the world were asleep or dead, only broken by the low panting as of some animal close to me. I felt a warm rasping at my throat, then came a consciousness of the awful truth which chilled me to the heart and sent the blood surging up through my brain. Some great animal was lying on me and now licking my throat. I feared to stir for some instinct of prudence bade me lie still but the brute seemed to realise that there was now some change in me, for it raised its head. 
Through my eyelashes I saw above me the two great flaming eyes of a gigantic wolf. Its sharp white teeth gleamed in the gaping red mouth, and I could feel its hot breath fierce and acrid upon me. For another spell of time I remembered no more. Then I became conscious of a low growl, followed by a yelp, renewed again and again. Then, seemingly very far away, I heard a hello, hello, as of many voices calling in unison. Cautiously I raised my head and looked in the direction whence the sound came, but the cemetery blocked my view. The wolf still continued to yelp in a strange way, and a red glare began to move around the grove of cypresses as though following the sound. As the voices drew closer, the wolf yelped faster and louder. I feared to make either sound or motion. Nearer came the red glow over the white paw which stretched into the darkness around me. Then, all at once from beyond the trees, there came at a trot a troop of horsemen bearing torches. The wolf rose from my breast and made for the cemetery. I saw one of the horsemen, soldiers by their caps and their long military cloaks, raise his carbine and take aim. A companion knocked up his arm, and I heard the ball whiz over my head. He had evidently taken my body for that of the wolf. Another sighted the animal as it slunk away, and a shot followed. Then, at a gallop, the troop rode forward, some towards me, others following the wolf as it disappeared amongst the snow-clad cypresses. As they drew nearer, I tried to move, but was powerless, although I could see and hear all that went on around me. Two or three of the soldiers jumped down from their horses and knelt beside me. One of them raised my head and placed his hand over my heart. "'Good news, comrades!' he cried. "'His heart still beats!' Then some brandy was poured down my throat. It put vigour into me, and I was able to open my eyes fully and look around. Lights and shadows were moving among the trees, and I heard men call to one another. They drew together, uttering frightened exclamations, and the lights flashed as the others came pouring out of the cemetery pell-mell, like men possessed. When the further ones came close to us, those who were around me asked them eagerly, "'Well, have you found him?' The reply rang out hurriedly, "'No, no, come away, quick, quick. This is no place to stay among this of all nights.' "'What was it?' was the question, asked in all manner of keys. The answer came variously and all indefinitely, as though the men were moved by some common impulse to speak, yet were restrained by some common fear from giving their thoughts. It, it indeed, gibbered one, whose wits had plainly given out for the moment. A wolf, and yet not a wolf, another put in shudderingly. No use trying for him without the sacred bullet, a third remarked in a more ordinary manner. Serve us right for coming out on this night. Truly we have earned our thousand marks, were the ejaculations of a fourth. There was blood on the broken marble, another said after a pause. The lightning never brought that there. And for him, is he safe? Look at his throat. See, comrades, the wolf has been lying on him and keeping his blood warm. The officer looked at my throat and replied, He's all right, his skin is not pierced. What does it all mean? We should never have found him before the yelping of the wolf. "'What became of it?' asked the man who was holding up my head and who seemed the least panic-stricken of the party, for his hands were steady and without tremor. On his sleeve was the chevron of a petty officer. "'It went to its home,' answered the man, whose long face was pallid and actually shook with terror as he glanced around him fearfully. "'There are graves enough there in which it may lie. Come, comrades, come quickly. Let us leave this cursed spot.' The officer raised me to a sitting posture as he uttered a word of command. Then several men placed me upon a horse. He sprang to the saddle behind me, took me in his arms, gave the word to advance, and turning our faces away from the cypresses, we rode away in swift military order. And yet my tongue refused its office, and I was perforce silent. I must have fallen asleep, for the next thing I remembered was finding myself standing up, supported by a soldier on each side of me. It was almost broad daylight, and to the north a red streak of sunlight was reflected, like a path of blood over the waste of snow. The officer was telling the men to say nothing of what they had seen, except that they had found an English stranger guarded by a large dog. Dog? That was no dog, cut in the man who had exhibited such fear. I think I know a wolf when I see one. The young officer answered calmly, I said a dog. Dog! reiterated the other ironically. It was evident that his courage was rising with the sun, and pointing to me, he said, Look at his throat, is that the work of a dog-master? 
Instinctively I raised my hand to my throat, and as I touched it, I cried out in pain. The men crowded round to look, some stooping down from their saddles, and again there came the calm voice of the young officer. A dog, as I said. If aught else were said, we should only be laughed at. I was then mounted behind a trooper, and we rode on into the suburbs of Munich. Here we came across a stray carriage, into which I was lifted, and it was driven off to the Quatre Saisons. The young officer accompanying me, whilst the trooper followed with his horse, and the others rode off to their barracks. When we arrived, Herr Delbruck rushed so quickly down the steps to meet me that it was apparent he had been watching within. Taking me by both hands, he solicitously led me in. The officer saluted me, and I was turning to withdraw when I recognised his purpose and insisted that he should come to my rooms. Over a glass of wine I warmly thanked him and his brave comrades for saving me. He replied simply that he was more than glad and that Herr Delbruck had at the first taken steps to make all the searching party pleased, at which ambiguous utterance the maitre d'hôtel smiled, while the officer pleaded duty and withdrew. But Herr Delbruck, I inquired, how and why was it that the soldier searched for me? He shrugged his shoulders as if in depreciation of his own deed, as he replied, I was so fortunate as to obtain leave from the commander of the regiment in which I served to ask for volunteers. But how did you know I was lost? I asked. The driver came hither with the remains of his carriage which had been upset when the horses ran away. But surely he wouldn't send a search party of soldiers merely on this account. Oh, no, he answered, but even before the coachman arrived, I had this telegram from the boyar, whose guest you are. And he took from his pocket a telegram which he handed to me, and I read, Bistritz, be careful of my guest. His safety is most precious to me. Should aught happen to him, or if he be missed, Spare nothing to find him and ensure his safety. He is English and therefore adventurous. There are often dangers from snow and wolves at night. Lose not a moment if you suspect harm to him. I answer your zeal with my fortune. Dracula. As I held the telegram in my hand, the room seemed to whirl around me, and if the attentive maitre d'hôtel had not caught me, I think I should have fallen. There was something so strange in all this, something so weird and impossible to imagine, that there grew in me a sense of my being in some way the sport of opposite forces, the mere vague idea of which seemed in a way to paralyse me. I was certainly under some form of mysterious protection. From a distant country had come, in the very nick of time, a message that took me out of the danger of the snow-sleep and the jaws of the wolf. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the Isn't locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do they don't come back, today, mother? What's the secret? Well, that was Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker. I have some news before I start talking about Bram Stoker or the story itself. First of all, I decided to do the shout-outs at the beginning, just in case anybody had fallen asleep after my commentary, so... Uh, I wanted to say Haley Forrest from New Zealand. New Zealand, now that's a long way from where I live, has bought me a coffee, so thank you very much. And Haley makes an interesting point about, I don't know if you remember the New Year episode, which was the experiment by M.R. James. For the first time, I used a sound effect, which was the tolling of a bell. Never used any sound effects before. And I was in two minds because I think there's something nice about the spoken word that doesn't have any sounds but um also i do like some of the dramatized um stuff i've been listening to in other podcasts so but she said that it, it it drowned out the commentary which i didn't pick up when i was mixing it but you know there we are so that's put me off using sound effects i think anyway so that's thank you to Haley forrest and who listens on Castbox. so thank you to Haley and thank you to Castbox for actually carrying the show i'm going to talk to you about bram stoker now so bram who needs no introduction from me because he's probably the best known horror writer after possibly Stephen King, and he was famous for writing Dracula. He wrote other stories such as The Lair of the White Worm and, and this one, Dracula's Guest. Um, he was Irish. He was born in 1847 from what we would probably call now an Anglo-Irish family. He was struck by a mysterious illness which made him bedridden until the age of seven, and then he went to school and was miraculously cured, cured to the extent that he became an athlete. 
um, at least at school and university. Then at university, he was a bright guy. He got his Bachelor of Arts and then he got his Master of Arts from Trinity College and got a job in the Irish Civil Service. Then he also did a bit of theatre reviewing on the side because I think he'd been interested in literature. He said he did mathematics at university, but there's some dispute about that and he appears to have done some kind of English or literature course. He was very interested in the theatre and used to write reviews. And this led him to doing a review for a play by Henry Irving, who was a very famous, very superstar, sort of the Brad Pitt of his times, or Keanu Reeves, or uh, Tom Hardy, or somebody like that anyway. Henry Irving, being an actor, and I don't know much about Henry Irving other than everywhere you go in the UK, there's a plaque that says Henry Irving played here. That He was a tiny bit of a narcissist, I think probably most actors are. And he, uh, he liked the nice review. So remember... Narcissists like ni nice reviews, just that's a hint to you. So um, he, uh, other thing to say about St um, Stoker was he, he knew Sheridan Lefano, who wrote Carmilla. Sheridan Lefano was Irish as well. They both were in Dublin. Stoker worked for Sheridan Lefano's paper. And of course, you know, as I said, when I was talking about Carmilla, Dracula owes a fair bit to Carmilla, I think. And the two guys knew each other. Um, Stoker was quite assiduous in his research and spent three years researching Central European folk folklore about vampires. But he became Henry Irving's manager and toured all round the UK at least, probably Ireland as well. And he stayed at Whitby in 1880. And of course, this is where Dracula comes ashore. And I really like Whitby and I was there in December, as I may have mentioned. Uh, he was 64 when he died in London. So he wasn't too old uh, at all. This story here actually was the first chapter of Dracula, but the publisher didn't want it. And, and although it's not, it's sold as a short story, um, and it kind of works, I think. It's an episode, certainly. And we realize that this is Jonathan Harker. In Dracula, Harker starts off in Bistritz in Transylvania. And, but this is clearly a, a prior chapter where he's in Munich and he goes for a little wander. And I suppose the purpose of this chapter is to show that Dracula wants him to come to his castle in Transylvania. Dracula gets the innkeeper to go looking for him, says how precious he is. But if we think of the story, he goes to this haunted village, he finds this marble tombstone of the woman with blood red lips, who's a countess from Styria. Interestingly, Styria is where Carmilla, Sheridan Lefano's vampire is set. So all these kind of obscure, forested, it's where the Krampus is as well, you know, the, the Christmas demon things that still go. So there's a lot of folklore in Styria as there, in, as there is in Transylvania. He, he is driven into this tomb. Why does he go there? Why does it horror movie and horror book people do these things? But if they didn't, we wouldn't have any stories. He goes to this tomb. He's driven there by the supernatural storm and the woman with blood red lips raises, but this mighty grasp grabs him. Supernatural grasp pulls him because Dracula's got powerful magic, as we know. Pulls him out and throws him out and saves his life. And then Dracula, or the storm, or both, blasts the tomb. And the woman vampire is knackered. But our man is then at risk of, of starving of cold, as my grandmother would say. This massive wolf sits on his chest and keeps him warm and basically saves his life. And he licks his throat where presumably the, uh, the vampire woman's had a go. Stoker has this idea of Europe absolutely full of vampires. You remember the Brides of Dracula, Dracula goes and goes in the castle, get away, this man is mine. Well, here we have outside Munich a flipping vampire as well. So they're apparently everywhere. But Dracula is a very jealous vampire and he doesn't want old uh, Jonathan Harker getting eaten before he gets to his castle. So there we are in terms of the story. I think it, I, I, what I liked about the story was I think the, the detail of the walk to the haunted village, and that's really nicely done. It's very gothic. The poor Germans in it, um, the Bavarians, end up as quite comic stock, you know, foreigner characters, and the soldiers to, to an extent as well. But of course, it's on Walpurgisnacht. A bad night. Don't go out on Walpurgisnacht. Actually, I think it's in April, so we've got a few months. Anyway, that's a story. It's not a bad story. I, I'm doing it because there is a link. We're doing more live ghost story events around about. We're just setting up some dates now and I'm going to do it slightly. I'm not going to do my own stories. I'm going to do one of my own stories, a Croglin vampire, I think, but I'm going to do it in a gothic theme. So I think I'm going to do, as I mentioned, Dracula's Guests, The Room in the Tower by E.F. Benson, my own Croglin vampire 
and one other which I'm looking for at the moment uh, might be Shalkin the Painter, might be another one. I've got the Penguin Book of Vampire Stories. I'm going to look for that. So any of you people who happen to be in the UK and fancy travelling to Carlisle on the 22nd of March, Sunday, we have a dinner, bed and breakfast deal, three-course dinner, tour of a haunted castle, Dalston Hall, which was built originally in Roman times, then most of what's standing is the oldest bit is Norman. Hooching with ghosts, and uh, we'll do a tour of the place, and do the ghost tour, tell you about the, the history and the ghosts there, then we'll have dinner, then we'll do the four stories, which will scare the pants off people, and then we'll go to bed and pay money to be awake all night. But in fact, actually it's a better deal because the price I was quoted was per couple. And I thought, oh, well, okay, it's a four-star hotel. Okay, okay. But in fact, it is um, £190 per couple for dinner, bed and breakfast, three-course dinner, plus the tour, plus the stories. So it's not a bad deal. So if you want to check that out, go to the website, which is ghostpod.org. So ghostpods all one word, G-H-O-S-T-P-O-D dot O-R-G. And you'll see it under events, 22nd, Sunday the 22nd, Dalston Hall. Uh, it's going to be a good night. So anyway, that's that. So thank you for all your support and love. I've changed podcast hosts to Captivate FM, mainly because the bloke who does it has this uh, South Yorkshire accent. So he's a fellow Northern Englishman. Did, you, did that reminds me with my ADHD? Did you remember? Did you see Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, where there's the very weird guy who goes, "I am a Northern Englishman," except he doesn't do it like that. It doesn't Northern accent. We always know that when I get to the part of the commentary, I start rambling that it's time to finish. So it is now time to finish. Thank you for all your love and your ratings and your coffees and your support. And uh, keep doing it. You know, got a new host. Hopefully we'll keep growing. Uh, the old host was good, but uh, I say this guy has a Sheffield accent, so what can you do? It's supposed to be a growth-orientated podcast, so the sky is the limit. Time for me to stop rambling. I'll speak to you next week. Okay, thank you.